great storm is over, lift up your wings and fly. Thunder and the lightning gave voice to the night. The littlest child cried aloud in her fright. Hush, little baby, a story I'll tell of a love that has vanquished the powers of have been the deaf shall have music the blind have new eyes the standards of death taken down by surprise alleluia the great storm is over lift up your wings and fly alleluia the great storm is over lift up your wings and New streams in the desert, new hope for the poor. The littlest children will dance as they sing and play with the bears and the lions in the spring. Alleluia, the great storm is over. Lift up your wings and fly. Alleluia, the great storm is over. The Lord loves his own and your mother is here. The child fell asleep as the lantern did burn. The mother sang on till her partner's return. Alleluia, the great storm is over. Lift up your wings and fly. Alleluia, the great storm over, lift up your wings and fly. Alleluia, the great storm is over, lift up your wings and fly. Alleluia, the great storm is over, lift up your wings and fly. Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church, both in person and on Facebook Live. We are a community of faith that strives to embody God's hospitality and love. So no matter how you join us, in person or online, know that we believe you are welcome here and loved by God. A few things about our service before we move deeper into worship. One, if you have a prayer you'd like to share, feel free to do that by jotting it down and passing it along to us in the sanctuary or share it on Facebook Live. And we can try to incorporate those later into the service. If we're unable to do that, we'll include them in the weekly email. For those on Facebook Live, feel free to comment and chat with one another. For those in the sanctuary, feel free to pull out your phone and log on and follow along and converse with people there. It's a great way to remind ourselves that we're connected during this continuing time of uncertainty. Also, those on Facebook Live, let us know where you're joining us from. I already see Lawton, Oklahoma, Burbank, and a number of other places. Again, it reminds us of God's welcome and love. Then finally, later in the service, we will break bread together. For those in the sanctuary, there were little communion cups as you entered the sanctuary. If you didn't get one, um, feel free to go grab one, but be aware of the plastic layer on the top. Um, that help, gives you access to the bread. And those online, feel free to grab whatever communion elements you have around. And know that when we break bread together, all are welcome, regardless of how you come to the table or where you are. Now with that all being said, let us stand and join together in song.
this is the garden here in the place i find you close this is communion here in this place i'm fully known it was all so simple you're so easy to love no space between us you're so easy to trust Closer, closer than my skin And you are in the air I'm breathing in Here's where the dead things come back to living I feel my heart beating again It feels so good to know you This is where I'm meant to be Me and you and you and me And I don't have to prove a thing You've already approved of me This is where I'm meant to be so good to know you are my friend and now as we begin a time of sharing of joys and concerns we give thanks for the gifts of musicians those who write songs and those who give language to things deep within our hearts. And so as we enter this time of prayer, I encourage those on Facebook Live to share your prayers, whether they're joys, concerns, or something in between. But as I share the prayers of this community, I will simply say, God, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. And so we continue by giving thanks for a space that allows us to remain connected, both virtually and in person. And so we give thanks that we remain connected as a community of faith. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for the following people within our community, for Silva and Verouge, as Silva continues to await eye surgery. For Stan, Diane's husband, who continues to recover at home, Pam J. For Audrey, Donna's mom, as she seeks to recover. And for Mark Voltz, Catherine Engel's brother, who was recently diagnosed with cancer. God, in your mercy. And we pray for those in assisted living facilities, especially as COVID-19 continues to increase. We pray for Janet, for Paul and Audrey. God, in your mercy. And as COVID-19 cases increase, and the Delta variant becomes a reality, we continue to pray for those who are on the front lines, for the doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, and all those who seek to make sense and provide healing in this time. We also pray for communities that are at a disadvantage, who are unable to receive the vaccines they need or access the health care that is so desperately needed. God, in your mercy. And we also pray for creation as fires continue to wreak havoc, not only in our own state, but across the world. We pray for others who are on the front lines, firefighters and communities that live in the midst of such destruction. 
We pray for our political leaders and other leaders that they might be aware of the very real reality of climate change and the threat it provides to God's good creation. God, in your mercy. And we also pray for students, teachers, and parents as they eagerly return to the school classroom. May we pray for their safety, their health, and their wholeness. God, in your mercy. And we also pray, as we watch the news from Afghanistan, we pray for those who exist in harm's way, refugees of all sorts, women and children who are the most vulnerable. But as we watch those images, we are also called to remember that refugees exist all over the world, painfully aware of their realities. May we pray for justice, for inclusion, and for systems that hold all people. God, in your mercy. And finally, we turn to that prayer, that prayer for our whole world. We pray for those who work for justice, for inclusion, reconciliation, hope, and love in all of its forms. God, in your mercy. And finally, we turn to this community of faith. May we continue to have the courage and tenacity to embrace love and God's vision for this world. God, in your mercy. Let us continue this time of prayer in reflection and song. There is none so worthy as you. There is none so worthy as you. There is none so worthy. There is none so true. There is none so worthy as you. There is none so faithful as you. There is none so faithful as you. There is none so faithful. There is none so true. There is none so faithful as you. so holy as you there is none so holy there is none so true there is none so holy as you there is none so loving as you there is none so loving as you. There is none so loving. There is none so true. There is none so loving as you. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God of deep grace and love, we give thanks for the gift of music, for words and notes that give meaning and embody some essence of intimacy and love. And so we start there by giving thanks, giving thanks for the opportunity to gather as a community, to remain connected virtually and in person, to share prayers, hopes, dreams, 
griefs, and uncertainties. And we ask that you, in the mystery of your love and grace, simply hold all of that. For you have heard the prayers we have spoken aloud this morning. Prayers for our world, prayers for our own lives, prayers for this community. And indeed, in a mysterious way, we believe that you also hear the prayers we are unable to say. Those things that cause great joy and those things that we hold with deep grief. So we ask again that you hold all of those things, both spoken and unspoken, weaving into the fabric of our very lives reminders of your peace that passes understanding, your love that knows no bounds, and your hope that persists beyond all despair. And so, God, we pray. We pray for this world and that you might weave that same truth into every place, corner, and shadow. That love might be experienced, that hope could be restored, and that indeed your peace is experienced both individually and communally. And finally, God, we turn back to this community of faith. May you continue to empower us to be people of love, to be people of hope, to be people of peace. We ask this all in the mystery of your sacred name. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Joshua 24, verses 1 through 2a and 14 through 18. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, he summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the, Euph the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us to our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Amen. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God of ancient story, open us to the complexity this day of being a community and being human. Open us to your story and ours. In your name we pray. Amen. I remember the first time I saw a Joshua tree in person. I'd never had the opportunity to see one beyond the pages of National Geographic or other magazines before moving out to California. And as the National Park Service would say, it's almost as if you're dropped in the middle of a Dr. Seuss book that has come alive. As you look at the Joshua tree, you wonder what on earth is going on with that tree. These seemingly branches and no branches that spike out in weird directions. As you get close to the tree, it's not the typical bark that you experience in other trees, but it's even harder and more coarse. I'll never forget the first time I seen that Joshua tree and that Mojave Desert. Weird, odd, I said. I'm no longer in the prairies of Oklahoma, the cornfields of Iowa, 
the coast of Connecticut or any other place I lived for that matter, I was plopped down in the middle of this, as I said, Dr. Seuss novel that seemed to come alive. And so I promptly returned home the day after I first spent time there and began to research the Joshua tree because it was my assumption that they probably named the Joshua tree after the biblical character that Sandy read about today, Joshua from the Hebrew Bible. I even read more about this tree, its unique way of sustaining life, its tenacity in the desert, its unique ability to thrive in the harshest and hottest of environments. And that's where I came across it. And it began to make sense why it was named after Joshua from the Hebrew Bible. Joshua himself and the Israelites had to be tenacious, had to have a hard sense to them. And in that ancient land, they were a little bit awkward and weird, didn't quite fit in with those who surrounded them. Indeed, it made sense that this strange tree in the desert was named after Joshua. And so that's where we get to step into the story this day with the realization that Joshua himself, like that tree, was a little bit hard-edged, tenacious, had to survive in some of the harshest of climates. And so that's where these words come today. Biblical scholars will tell us that this comes at the end of the book of Joshua and is probably used as a refrain or a renewal of a covenant, a reminder of where Joshua and Israel had come and a reminder of where they were going. One, we get a rehearsal of that story of liberation from slavery. The fact that they'd wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and ultimately had been liberated to experience the fullness that God offered them. And then as scholars will remind us, then they are called to make that covenant. That in the wake of that experience, they are called to commit themselves to God and to service and to love. Beautiful and wonderful how that renewal covenant ceremony comes together. And a powerful reminder for us that Israel and its people had experienced this kind of covenant time and time again. That through their history, they would, call, they would be called to draw on this renewal and this covenant to start over again and again. Because you know, the footnote to this story is that even though they pledged or made this pledge, that they would have to make it time and time again. That they would have to return to the deep well of this covenant and remind themselves that they are bound to God and to their neighbor time and time again. Let's take a moment to traverse the history of the Hebrew Bible. Abraham and Sarah needed to make a covenant. Ruth needed to make a covenant. Jacob, later renamed Israel, needed to make a covenant. Moses needed to make a covenant. That Miriam needed to make a covenant. Then we get to Joshua. He needed to make a covenant. Solomon, David, Jonathan, Esther, and the myriad of characters that emerge in the Hebrew Bible had to return to that notion of God and service time and time again. They need to return to this idea that they're called to be tenacious, hard-edged, and to survive in harsh climates. And that's where we get this sense of covenant and a renewal, as biblical scholars would say. It's not unlike our own time and place. It seems like the past 18 months to two years, we've faced that same experience. Each time we put one foot forward, it seems we have to start again. Recommit to safety. Recommit to loving our neighbors. Recommit to the health and well-being of our communities. Time and time again. So it might serve us well to step into this renewal covenant. To remind ourselves, like Joshua, that in some mysterious way we are bound to God. That love and mystery that surpasses all understanding. And in a mysterious way, we are still called to love our neighbors and offer ourselves for the greater good. 
And thus I return to the Joshua tree, that strange Dr. Seuss-like tree that exists in the middle of the desert. Because it doesn't exist out of its own weirdness and tenacity, but it provides life, shelter, and well-being for the very created world that exists around it. For those who don't live in Southern California or who haven't been in that part of the world, I invite you to Google the Joshua Tree and to read about the ways it provides life in the midst of that land. And I could go on and on about the beauty and power of covenant, of Joshua, of that earlier Israelite community, but I would be remiss if I don't mention a footnote in this story. And that in all the beauty and joy of Israel being liberated and Joshua making this covenant, there is a footnote about the Amorites. Did you catch that in this story? That in order for all that beauty, joy, and covenant making that happened, the footnote is that there were people that already existed on that land and in that place. Did you hear that in the story? The Amorites needed to be pushed out to make way. It's not just a footnote. In our minds, in our place, we can easily gloss over that part of the story because covenant is so beautiful. Because Israel getting an opportunity to start again is so profound and compelling. But in the quest to begin again and to strike out on a new covenant, Israel and Joshua well, were terribly human and in a mysterious way privileged. They pushed out the Amorites. Sure, this story labels it as God's action. But I stand in line with other biblical scholars that that was probably a later interpretation of a terrible human event and travesty that saw the Amorites fall victim to violence, marginalization, and isolation. And I also return to the Joshua tree for that same story because you see the Joshua tree wasn't its original name. That naturalists and biologists will help us to recall that there were people that lived on that land long before white pioneers traversed that land and named that tree Joshua. That there were other people that used that tree as fuel for fires, as building materials and as other things. That that tree exists long before the Joshua tree name. And so thus, I believe the footnote of this story becomes the next powerful teaching that we have from this text. Is that we, we begin again and covenant with God. We are called to pay attention to the stories and people that have been harmed and left out. That have historically been othered or marginalized that have been left out of the broader story of God's beauty and God's grace, not by God's design, but by human action. Not by God's design, but by human action. And so, like preacher Stephen Johnson will say, we can look back at Joshua and see stories of exile and inclusion. We can see stories of living land and violent pushovers and overthrowing. We can see God's love and human disgrace in that story. But as he would remind us, we can see it in our own story. It doesn't take us long to dig into our own history to find those shadows, those mistakes, and those stories of deep oppression. Google it. Read about it. Those stories, those pains are deeply there, not only within the church, but in our wider society. So what does this all mean? It means we're called to return to this covenant, this notion that we are bound by God and called to offer that same love to others. But when making that covenant, we are called to be frighteningly aware of all stories 
and all people. We are called to be aware of the ways in which we construct story and understand privilege. We are called to be aware of the ways in which we build community and construct spaces of love and safety. That we are called to be aware of our past and how it has left some people out, othered and hurt. And that as we step into this new beginning, that we might create systems and communities that truly and unashamedly include, embrace, affirm, and embody justice for all. That as we as a people of faith step into this new beginning we have of virtual and in-person worship, we are called to be aware of welcome, hospitality, and grace. As we begin to build new outreach and justice opportunities, we are called to be aware of people that have been historically harmed and othered and to build systems that affirm God's love and God's grace. As we hold the seriousness of Joshua's renewal covenant, we are called to hold that same seriousness when we make covenants, pledges, and offer our vision for the future of who we are and who we can become. This day, and almost every day, we are called to be aware of the fullness of our history, the fullness of who God calls us to be, and the mystery of God's love that holds each and every one of us, that we might be that strange tree that is both beautiful and hard, that is both awkward and grace-filled, that offers life and nurtures the ground, that is a gift of God and a gift to others. Thanks be to God for the complexity of Joshua, for the beauty of a tree in a desert, and the grace that this community might offer as it recommits itself to God and to love. Amen. Good morning. We have now reached that moment in our worship service where we break bread and practice Holy Communion. For those of you participating virtually, I encourage you to gather your communion elements. And for those of you here in person, please prepare to carefully open your prepackaged communion cup. In the disciples' tradition, communion is the central element of our weekly worship. And all are welcome at the Lord's table as God's love is available to all who choose to receive it. Please join us as we come to the table this morning to remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we may have everlasting life. And so we tell a story that as Jesus was gathered with his closest friends, he took a loaf of bread, blessed it, and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a similar way, he took a cup and after giving thanks, poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant given for you and for all. In a few moments, we will take the bread together. Dave will then lead us in the Lord's prayer and we will take the cup together. But no matter how you understand this meal, no matter what elements you use, know that you are welcome in this space. Let us take the bread together. Before we say the Lord's Prayer today, I just want to remind you all that everyone has their own way of calling the Lord God. 
our Creator, feel free to do so as we join together in saying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I realized as I came up here, I forgot to bring up my communion. Forgive me. <laughs> I thought I had it together. <clears throat> One of the things as I walked into the sanctuary today, I walked past our portico with uh, what I like to call the sculpture that's out there. Uh, it's a display reminding me um, of what this church truly believes, that all lives matter. And as a church, we continue to show that through the missions that we support and continue to implement even during this challenging time. Also out in the narthex today, I picked up a flyer. And I know some of these things are posted uh, on our website and online. But it, it, at the very top of it, it says, Burbank First Christian Church, community-focused. And on it are listed our missions, a few of them anyway. BTAC, Burbank Temporary Aid. Project Mercy, where we build homes down in Tijuana. Family Promise, where we house families that are unhoused. Family Ministries, and we have many others as well. However, these ministries don't just happen. They don't just take place. It takes money as well as participation. And actually, contributing financially may be the only way that many of us can now participate in these ministries. Please continue to support us through, in these missions through the easy tithe that you can find on the icon on your screen. And once again, thank you for your continued support of these missions and the many others that we do here at uh, FCCB. And these are just some of the things that we have going, but I also want to pass along to Brandon the social events and our social calendar that we have going on as well. All right, thank you, Brandon. Thanks, Dave. Yes, the first social event is coffee and conversation immediately following worship. For those in the sanctuary, there will be prepackaged snacks and an opportunity to catch up with one another. Also, for those in person and online, there is a softball update. Check your email. Um, there's some forms you need to fill out in that. And for those who want to come and watch our incredibly gifted and talented softball team, we start next Sunday. Once that schedule is available, I'll share it with you. It's fun to watch our team play, I, I assure you. Anyway, I, I'll just leave it at that. Also, our weekly, our weekly opportunities for ministry and community continue. Bible study on Wednesday evenings, a weekly reflection group on Thursday, and we have um, a somewhat new opportunity on Thursdays, homemade Thursdays, a group that prepares and then delivers food to those living in the encampments. Um, and then also, uh, our lunch packing for Bur Burbank Temporary Aid Center is coming up. Steve and Cinda have more information about that, and that will be in the weekly email. So basically, pay attention to the weekly email. And if you're not on that list and would like to in be included in that, reach out to us and we'll make sure you're on that email list. Now, a lot of activities here at First Christian Church. If you have any questions, uh, find me after church or send us a message on Facebook and we'll get back to you. Now, Britt, Zach, and Marina, thank you for your gifts of ministry. Thank you, Brandon. If you're with us in person, please stand for our closing song, Sometimes by Step. And if you're joining us virtually, Brandon will put the lyrics in our Facebook thread so you can follow along and sing with us as well.
Sometimes the night was beautiful Sometimes the sky was so far away Sometimes it seemed to stoop so close You could touch it but your heart would break Sometimes the morning came too soon Sometimes the day could be so hot There was so much work left to do But so much you'd already done Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you seek you in the morning and I will learn to walk in your ways and step by step you lead me and I will follow you all of my days sometimes I think of Abraham how one star he saw had been lit for me he was a stranger in this land I am that no less than he And on this road to righteousness Sometimes the climb can be so steep I will falter in my steps But never beyond your reach Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you seek you in the morning and learn to walk in your ways step by step you lead me and i will follow you all of my days and i will follow you all of my days yes i will follow you all of my days and step by step you lead me and i will follow you all of Family of God, go out to the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit be with each and every one of us. Let us go in peace. Amen. <laughs>